So because we're busy people, all of us are, are, are busy people, uh, I would think, and because many of us barely have enough time to get done what we need to get done, we rarely ever stop to think on the important things. Questions like, where did this all come from? When you're a kid, at least when I was a kid, you know, I always thought of that. Where did this all come from? It's, it's kind of crazy to think about it. We rarely think on these things, but if you're honest, we all do from time to time. I think we should probably ask these questions more than we do, but the reality is the way you answer questions like that is going to determine how you live your life in the everyday busyness. There's a hierarchy everywhere in life. Everywhere there's a hierarchy. And we don't question the hierarchy. At work, you have a boss. Maybe you are the boss. I don't know. Depending on where you are in that hierarchy at work determines your role. At home, you have parents. They're the authority over the children. At school, you have teachers. Then you have the principal. Then you have the superintendent. And so on and so on it goes. If you're out and about in the street, there's police officers. And then there's... Um, you know, uh, the chief, and then there's, you go to the courthouse, and there's lawyers and judges, and there's this whole system, this hierarchy of authority set up that nobody really stops to question. We just assume that they're the authority. But we don't stop to ask the question, where does the authority end? Where does it end? Who made all this? Who is supreme over this? Like, is the authority really stop with, say, the prime minister here or the president in the United States? Is that where it ends? Or the Supreme Court? Like, where does it end? Who is supreme? We don't question the other hierarchies of authority in our lives. But when it comes to asking who the ultimate authority is, people will say, well, maybe there isn't one. But we don't stop to question the other ones. We just assume they're true. But when you stop, who's stop to ask who the ultimate one is, people are just like, there is no ultimate one. There can't be. Okay, so where do all the other authorities come from? Where do they find their supremacy? From, from nowhere? Is, so is their authority just an illusion? Therefore, not an authority at all? You see how this thing breaks down? No, you know that it's true that there is legitimate authority because that's, that's how you live. That's how you live your life. There is a high king in heaven, one who is supreme over all this, who rules and reigns. I mean, just look to creation, the, the vastness of the, of the thing, the glory in the night sky with the stars and the moon and all that. And you just instinctually know there is one who made this, and the one who made this is infinitely greater than this. Because he made it. What is shocking about Christianity is that the mystery and the glory of the one who made it all became a human being to save people. Like if that wasn't crazy enough, he did it to save people who loved him. No, he did it to save people who hate him. Jesus, the Supreme One, is the one. In the passage I'm about to preach this morning is one of the most glorious in all of Scripture as far as de descriptions of who Jesus is. So this is how the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to describe it. In verse 15, he says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and, inv and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So Paul takes us all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, when he calls Christ the image of the invisible God. Now, I find it super interesting that he would call Christ the image of the invisible God. Don't those things sound contradictory? How can you be the image of something invisible? Think about it. God commands us in the second commandment. Who knows what the second commandment is of the ten? 
I mean, you should. I kind of gave it away already with the whole image talk. The, se the second commandment is, you shall not make any graven images of anything, whether on earth or in heaven or below the earth or whatever. No graven images to worship. No images to worship. That's the second commandment. Now, Paul is saying Christ is the image of the invisible God. What is going on here? Talk about the image of God in the Bible, however, is not always framed in a negative way like it is in the second commandment. This idea of the image of God is first found on the first page of the Bible. God says that he made man and woman in his, what? Image. And after his likeness. The reason we don't make images to worship is because we are the image of God. So to make an image to worship would be to deny your own identity. We image God by doing God-like things on earth. We image God by taking dominion of the earth, subduing the earth, ruling it as his representatives. That's what he said in Genesis 1. He says, I made them in my image. And then he says to them, go, be fruitful, multiply, have dominion, subdue the earth, rule over the animals, and so on. D be what I am. Rule over the thing I gave you under my authority, of course. So then... What's Paul trying to say here? Is he saying Jesus is just like you and I, like an image of God? No, Jesus' is Jesus's imaging of God is different. He is not a imager. It says he is the image of the invisible God. Furthermore, he is the, it says, firstborn of all creation. Now, what does that mean? Is Jesus the first creation of God, like a Jehovah Witness might tell you? No. It means he's the originating cause of all things. He's the creator. So now we're getting into philosophy, which I enjoy. I don't know how many others enjoy philosophizing, but I could do it all day. The, question, the big question in philosophy is, um, what is prime reality? Are you following me? What is prime reality? In, in, in other words, what is the really real? Paul says Jesus is the prime reality because from him everything originates. He's the originating cause of all things. So therefore he is the really real thing and everything that flows out of him therefore is real because he is the prime reality. That's enough philosophizing for now, okay? In Christ, God became visible. The invisible God is fully and totally somehow mysteriously bound up in this person called Jesus. He's at the same time fully God and fully man. He's not half man and half God, okay? Fully God and fully man at the same time. This is what theologians call the hypostatic union. So if you have notes, right? Hypostatic union. Jesus equals fully God, fully man. That's called the hypostatic union. Verse 16 tells us that by him, that's Jesus, all things were created by him. Whether in heaven or on earth, whether visible or invisible, he talks about thrones and dominions. A lot of times people focus on Jesus as being the creator God when they read this verse. And that's true and that's fine because that's what it says. But Paul's emphasizing something here we, we sometimes ignore. Not only is Jesus the creator of the physical world, like, you know, the leaves and the ground and the trees and you and me, but he's also the creator of the spiritual world. He talks about thrones and dominions. You know, that, that spiritual realm where angels and demons are duking it out is just as much his creation as our physical world where, where men are duking it out with sin and death and with each other. All these things were created, it says, by him. And then it says, through him and then for him. All of creation, even the stuff you don't see by him, through him, and for him, finds its ultimate purpose in Christ. And for all of history, men have been at war with each other 
for a really one reason, right? To become supreme, the supreme one. Nations rise and they fall. We talked about this in Daniel for like 100 weeks or whatever it took to get through it. But kingdoms reign and they fall and someone else comes in and they take that kingdom from themselves for themselves and, and they want to become supreme. And we look at the world and we just instinctu instinctually know this was made for a purpose. If we didn't think there was a purpose for this place where we live, then, then why fight? Why have wars and nations? Why strive for good over evil? Like, do you know why there's wars? Because one or both sides thinks they're, they're good and the other's evil. And so they fight for the good that they may be right in fighting for or wrong in, in fighting for. But the underlying presupposition is they think there's a purpose here, a purpose worth fighting for and dying for. Some people like to say that the world was made for us, and there's truth in that. We are made in God's image, and he made this place for us to dwell in and be fruitful and multiply in. However, the error comes when we think we're the main purpose. We're simply the beneficiaries of God's grace here. This was made for, for, for Christ. It says it was made by him, through him, and what? For us? No, for him. For him. God made the world for his son's glory and fame. And by extension, he made you to worship and glorify his son in it. It was made through him and for him. You just get to, to benefit from that. See, ironically, in our sinful hearts, we think if something is to be good for us, it's for us. Not realizing that the best thing for you actually is to worship another, to glorify another. And then you find your true purpose in getting rid of yourself to worship Christ. It's backwards, but it's just the way it is. It's, it's just how it works. We go to war with each other because our sin compels us in vain to, to ascend to God's throne. Look, they desire a good thing, right? To rule and reign on the earth. But they desire it in an evil, in an evil way to rule and reign without God as the supreme authority. When we go to war with each other, we want to rule and reign over Christ, not under him. But this world is not a stage for glorifying men and women. It's a stage for men and women to glorify Christ. It's for Him. All of it is for Him, not for us. And He's before all things, it says, and in Him all things hold together. It really is amazing that the God who holds all things together from the largest galaxy to the smallest atom became a human being. Think about that. That's why I said this is like a meal you just can't eat. He was conceived in the womb of a woman, a woman he created, in a woman he holds together. Like the little fetus Jesus in the womb is not only holding the sun together, but the very woman in whose body he's growing, he's sustaining. But he's a fetus. The implication, I don't know what to tell you. If that doesn't blow you away, then maybe God can send a wind to blow you away. I don't know. The implications of the hypostatic union are like they're just staggering to consider. And he did this to save us when we hated him from sin and death for, for the glory of his name and the praise of his glory he's the supreme one the story is not about us primarily but we get to benefit from the supreme one's love and sacrifice that's a good thing whether it's spiritual dominions or physical christ reigns supreme over them all all the demons of hell tremble at his feet and all the angels of heaven worship him. Listen, it's not, I'll wait for him to pass by because this is important. 
it's not Jesus versus Satan. Okay? This is a false paradigm. It's not Jesus versus Satan. It's Satan being subjected under Jesus. That's the true reality of the spiritual war. Satan, Satan doesn't... It's like Mike Tyson versus a baby or something. I don't know how else, I don't know how to describe this thing. But Satan's like not in the same ring with him. Do you know what I'm saying? He he, he doesn't stand a chance. Jesus is is over him, under his feet. It's not Jesus versus Satan. So get rid of that Hollywood idea, that South Park idea where Jesus and Satan fight each other. No, it's not even it's not even a fight. Jesus is not one among many. He's supreme above all. All things depend upon him to exist. Satan depends upon him to exist. The blaspheming atheist only blasphemes because Jesus permits him to. Because Jesus gives him the air in his lungs to blaspheme his name. He's the matchless one. There's none like him. I mean, and what a tremendous privilege to worship him. Christ is mine, and he and I am his. I mean, is there anything better than that? He's with us. He'll never leave us or forsake us. This Jesus that the scripture describes, more than we can imagine. He's supreme over all things. And furthermore, he is the supreme Savior, sufficient Savior. Verse 18 says this. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in sorry, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So Paul continues to describe the supremacy of Christ. Sorry, I need to go with the wind, I think. There we go. But now he's connecting it to the church, his supreme work of redemption. Christ, he says, is the head of the church. Now, this might seem like an obvious point, right? Christ is the head of the church. Not really one worth mentioning since this should just be assumed. But let's be honest with ourselves. We need a reminder of this because we forget. Now, I would wager to say that for the vast majority of Christians, Christ being the head of the church is, this, is just something you have to confess to be part of the club or whatever. How many, but how many people actually live like that's true? I mean, the reality for many churches is that the denomination or the confessional statements are the head of the church. And if you deviate from them, then you're kind of not part of the club. <laughs> but listen to me. Denominations and confessions, though they're not necessarily bad, did not rise from the dead. Paul tells us that Christ, the head of the church, is also the beginning, the firstborn, what? From the dead. He's the first person to rise from the dead and not die again. There's a few miracles in the Old Testament with some resurrections. Christ rose Lazarus from the dead, but they all died again. Jesus didn't. He's still alive. Being the firstborn from the dead means he's the first of the new humanity. Which is amazing to consider that he's also God. God, but also the first of the new humanity. A lot of people have an issue with God because they say, God doesn't understand me. And when you're in a, in a season of suffering, you know, I can understand how you might say that. But this is a lie from the pit of hell. God himself became a human being like you, and he suffered just like you. And as a matter of fact, Jesus is your only hope in suffering. Because he's the firstborn from the dead. His resurrection demonstrates that there is hope for eternal life without suffering. This is why Paul says he's the firstborn from the dead, so that in everything he may be preeminent. Preeminent means to be first above all others. Now, imagine believing that Christ is the firstborn from the dead. Imagine believing 
He is the one who defeated death and by the power of his resurrection establishes the church. Imagine believing all that and then stopping to look at the church on this continent. There's a disconnect, a big disconnect. I've heard from some of you about the problem of many denominations. What's with all the denominations? Why are there so many denominations? Shouldn't we be united in unison? I mean, it's a great question. And frankly, I'm not satisfied with the traditional answer that you know denominations are just like different expressions or something. I'm not satisfied with that answer. What I've discovered, what I've discovered is that the differing denominations aren't really the issue. That's a smokescreen. That's not the issue, because I've met Christians that go to all types of different uh, denominations and churches, but you know, you just know they're a child of God, because the Holy Spirit in both of you testifies of that truth. We want to look on the outward, the denominations and the confessions, but there's one church and one spirit. There always has been. And I've had this experience many times where you meet some random person in the street or on the store or in the store or something, a cashier or whatever, and you chat for a minute and, and then I just say like, hey, are you a Christian? And they're like, yeah. How did, how did, we didn't really talk about, about Christ or anything, but you just kind of know because Christ is the head of the church. He's preeminent. We have the same king. It's like if you're in a foreign land fighting a a war, when you come across one of your own countrymen, it doesn't take long for you to realize that. Whether they're from one battalion or or one legion or another makes no difference because you both know who the preeminent one is above you. You both serve the same king. You're both from the same kingdom. So you recognize one another. Christ is the head. It says the preeminent one. And then again Paul says, In Christ, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Wow. Through Christ, all things were reconciled to him, whether in heaven or earth, making peace by the blood of his cross. The peace of Christ that has been accomplished on the cross is not a small thing. It's an all-encompassing thing. It's not a, a thing we confine to just, you know, personal salvation. The cross of Christ doesn't just make salvation possible, it actually accomplished it. When Jesus said it, notice he said it is finished, not balls in your court. (laughs) That's not what he said. He said it's done. He actually did something. He finished something. And now he sits enthroned in heaven as the preeminent one, the head of the church, the king of kings, the ruler, the sovereign over all the universe. And we can become so discouraged when we read this extravagant description of Christ and then look at the church, right? It's like, man, if if this is Jesus, then why are we so, like, lame? (laughs) Why, Why, you know, but don't become discouraged. There's no reason. God has his church. He has it. He's preeminent. He's the head of it. And when we spend all day looking at the faults of the churches, we tend to miss the majesty of Christ. That doesn't mean we don't offer constructive criticism or when things are, are need to be corrected or, or made you know, better or whatever. It uh, doesn't mean we don't point out faults and things like that. Of course not. But what it does mean is that when we see these massive pitfalls, we don't go to the culture for the answer. We don't go, oh man, the church is so lame and, and there's a disconnect and stuff and, and this is the worst. And maybe there is a disconnect, and, and there probably is, but we don't go in the despair to the culture for answers. We go to the head of the church, right? If there's a problem in the church, why go to CEO, you know, Bill Gates and ask for business tips on how to build this thing? No, you go to the head. Hey, Jesus, this is your thing, right? Fix it. <laughs> That's what it means to believe he's the head of the church. Go to his word to determine what it means to be the church and function as the church. You don't go to pragmatic worldly practices. Pragmatism isn't the head of the church. Worldly business tactics aren't the head of the church. Denominational quotas or confessions aren't the head of the church. Christ is. Problem is, when you start to actually live like he is, you end up meeting at the park outside (laughs) and doing crazy stuff. 
He's supreme over the church. His word is the final say. His word's the final say. Our opinions aren't the standard. Our sensibilities aren't the standard. Our feelings and traditions and upbringing, hello, upbringing, some of us were brought up in this thing, that isn't the standard either. He is. He's the head. His word is the standard. Period. And, and Christ doesn't give us suggestions in his word. It's not the ten suggestions. He doesn't say, if you heed my suggestions, if you love me, you'll heed my suggestions. No, he doesn't say that. We need to, we need to stop treating his word as if it's giving us suggestions that we can, you know, judge and determine if we want to obey or not. He's preeminent, the king of the universe, the head of the church, our great savior. Verse 21. If it'll open for me here. And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. For most of this passage, Paul has been extolling and describing the preeminence of Christ, and rightfully so. But now he begins to talk to us and to you. Yes, you. You. And you. And you. And you. Everyone here. He's talking to you. What about us? What about you? He says, you were once alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds. Yikes. That's sort of a stark contrast between Christ, the preeminent one that he just spent the time talking about, and then you. Christ is great, he's preeminent, he's, he's glorious, the fullness of God dwells in him, and, and then, but then there's you. <laughs> you were alienated, you're hostile, doing evil deeds. Christ is the holy, righteous God, man, and you are just evil. <laughs> That's what kind of the contrast Paul's given us. Now, though that seems like a grim diagnosis, it's actually good news because Christ came to reconcile you, the evil, hostile, alienated ones. So he came for in his body by his death. Christ, by dying on the cross, has reconciled us back to God. And though we were alienated, not part of God's family, he bought us with his blood, redeemed us, and adopted us into that family. Now, why does he do this? Well, there's several, several reasons, but chief among them is, Dave, what? For his glory. Talk to Dave, he'll always remind you of that. He did it for his glory and his fame. He didn't even necessarily do it for your good. <laughs> Although, it is your, for your good, and he does love you, and that's part of it. But the, the primary reason was for his glory. Wrapped up in his glory and fame is our own transformation. He dies to reconcile us from our evil deeds, to present us as holy and blameless and above reproach. So th that's another contrast, right? You got alienated, hostile, evil, and then all of a sudden, because Christ dies, you got holy, blameless, above reproach. It's a tall order, but this is the power of the gospel to take an alienated sinner and transform them into a holy saint. Now, holy doesn't mean what most of us thinks it means. Holy just means to be set apart to God. And by the way, if you're a Christian, you're technically a saint. You know, a church body cannot catechize you and make you a saint. It doesn't work that way. God makes you a saint when you believe. It means our whole lives have been consecrated and set apart for the glory and service of Jesus. We are a holy people unto the Lord. What that means is your life is now set apart for the Lord, not yourself. So when someone asks you what's life about, you don't say, you don't list off a bunch of garbage about what you want to accomplish. You say it's about Jesus and his glory. Simple. Not of the world, different, set apart for a kingdom, a heavenly one that's conquering and coming to envelop the whole world. That's what it means to be holy. Christ, the preeminent one, 
That's what he came to accomplish and fulfill. And the ultimate goal, that all things would be in subjection to him. And he demonstrates this by setting apart a once hostile and evil people to now be his ambassadors in an evil generation. And eventually rulers in his righteous kingdom that's coming. Treason is one of the highest crimes you could commit in any nation. Even worse than murder. Murder might, you know, land you in jail or something. But committing treason will often get your citizenship revoked and in many countries will is give you the death penalty. But what exactly is treason? Treason and why is it a harsh punishment? Treason is defined as the crime of being of betraying one's country, especially by attempting to kill the sovereign or overthrow the government. Now, that's what Christianity is. It's treason. Being a Christian is to be treasonous. Becoming a Christian in the real sense is committing treason on the world. Committing treason on Satan. This passage tells us we were alienated. But alienated from what? From God in his in citizenship in his kingdom. That's what you were alienated from. Assuming or presupposing that you were in another kingdom before you became a citizen of God's kingdom. So you were in the kingdom of darkness. That's what the Bible says. He transferred us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. So you became a treasonous rebel in the kingdom of darkness when you jumped ship to Jesus. Christianity is to be treasonous to the world. He comes to a hostile people and redeems them out of darkness. He sets us apart to be holy, meaning we become treasonous to the former kingdom. So we've left and forsaken our former citizenship and embraced another, Jesus. And we're living, now here's the thing, we're still living in enemy territory though. And we're living in enemy territory now as treasonous traitors. But praise be to God, it's the very blood of the preeminent one, Jesus, that saved us. And he makes us holy to present us before his Father blameless. Now, naturally, as treasonous traitors to the devil and faithful citizens to Christ, we're going to encounter some opposition, right? This is why Paul ends this section by admonishing us to remain stable and steadfast. We cannot be shifting back and forth in the world one day, in Christ another, back and forth, back and forth. We have to cling close to the hope of the gospel of our preeminent king, the supreme one, Jesus. And although we come against opposition and trouble in life, although the devils of hell try to undo us, as Martin Luther wrote, we will not fear for thou art with us. Jesus is our sufficient Savior, and we do well. We do well to live as treasonous rebels to the kingdom of darkness, because Christ, who is King of Kings, to disobey Him would be a far greater treason. The far greater treasonous act is against Christ, not the devil. Treason against the devil is a little thing compared to treason against the king of kings. The devil subjected to Christ, remember? Under his feet, he's defeated. So let's remain firm, steadfast, trusting in Christ who bought us out of darkness with his own blood. There's none like him. He stands alone at the top and all things are brought into submission under him. Will be, eventually. He will rule with a rod of iron, and there's no one who will say to him, What have you done? Why did you do this? Or why did you, did you do that? He's matchless. He's blameless. And at his name, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Why? 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 To the glory of God the Father. It's all for his glory. It's all for his honor. It's all for his fame. Because he's supreme over all things. He's the only sufficient savior of sinners. Now, preaching a passage like this is a tall order. It's the living word of God. It's the Bible. Any passage, really. The preaching ministry is a hard one. Week by week, you know, praying and striving to expound God's word to feed my own heart and to feed all your hearts. 
you know, but what's even harder is that the fact is that this is a ministry of failure. It just is. Every week, it's a ministry of failure, especially when I get to a passage like this. I know I can't, with my mere human words, do justice to the glory and majesty of Jesus Christ. And so every week I get up here and I fail. I try my best, but my best isn't good enough because there's no way I can, as a hum as dust, somehow stand up here and describe and explain the infinite God. But I'm thankful that our, our Jesus is merciful and uses our feeble attempts to preach his glory for our good and for his glory. And as I get to the conclusion of this message here, I'm frankly, I'm just at a loss for words. I, I don't know what to say. The mystery, the depth, the wisdom wrapped up in Jesus, like, how do I even start? How can an infinite or finite human being begin to understand, let alone explain to you, all the implications of the infinite God of creation becoming a man to die on the cross to defeat death for you? Like, I, yeah, I use fancy terms like hypostatic union so you think I sound smart. Like, when you look into the night sky, sometimes, if you do this often, you just look. Do this next time, if, if you will. Look for depth. Look into the night sky and look for depth. Try to go as deep as you can. It's huge. I've tried it many times, and eventually you get to a point where you know there's more depth, but it feels like your eyes are going to pop out of your head. Anybody experience that? You get lost in it because it's so big. Now remember, remember, when you do that, that the one who made all that by just speaking it, it wasn't hard for God to make it. He just said, let there be light. And he put stars and lights and luminaries and it was so. The one who made all that, like, like became a human and died for you. The one who reigns supreme over all this is the only sufficient savior for sinners. That is absolutely mind-blowing. We can't even, you can't even look at the sun and not go blind. Maybe you can glance at it, but look at it for a couple minutes, you'll go blind. Probably even, not even a couple minutes. You can't even look at the thing, but the thing allows you to see everything else. Jesus made it. I can't even look at it. I tried. He made it. I'm looking at it through trees and I still can't do it. He made it and sustains it. And then that one, that, that being of God, he looked at us in our pitiful, alienated states as rebels of God, as haters of God, and he says, here's an idea. Let me go down there and become like them and then die for them. And then we want to make this about us? We, 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 we talked about this on Thursday for a while. About making, uh, about how we want to take the Bible to, to be about us. No. It, it, it can't be. Unless you, unless like, whenever I hear preaching of like man-centered stuff, I'm like, are you reading it? <laughs> are you actually reading this? Because like, I don't see how you could get that. And I'm not like a brilliant man or anything. It's for him, his glory. Do you see now how evil it is to deny Christ? Run to him, like run to him quick, who is the image of the invisible God, the true imager of God. You're, you're made in God's image, but because of sin, we've become corrupt. When we look to Jesus, we see a, a pure, whole image of what an imager of God ought to be. The true imager of God. He is your purpose. Everything's wrapped up in Him. Life and joy and peace. Sort of sounds like a Christmas message a little bit. <clears throat> but it's all in Him. It's all in Him. Look no further. I say it all the time here. Stop searching. You found it. It's Jesus. Now pursue Him with all you got until you die and then be with him forever.
Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. I thank you, God, that you, um, you came to earth, that you condescended so low for us, people who, before you encountered us, were hostile, were, were alienated, were doing evil deeds, you say. I thank you that you transform us and transfer us and adopt us into your family, into your kingdom. I pray you help us to live uh, in the awe and the majesty of who you are, Jesus. Um, and that we would never lose that childlike faith. You say, you say if you want to enter the kingdom, you got to be like a child. And, and children are always learning and, and things that we adults sometimes aren't impressed with anymore, a child is enamored with. Help us to be enamored and awe in awe in, of you, Lord. So we need you and we love you. We pray this all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.